where they can scan their card and update their, their, their shareholder card or their levy payer card and update the details themselves. We've put videography in. We've created a green room so we don't have to fly to uh, uh, Paris to be in Paris. You film it in front of the green room and put the Eiffel Tower in the background. So we've got a high, high focus on digital. We know that social media has, is hungry for content and we've got to feed it. And I wanted to uh, just show you our websites in a minute and then talk a little bit about Woolmark Prize and the Wool Lab. Here's the imagery for Cool Wool. Cool Wool was one of those programs that was developed in the 70s and it worked well. There's a few grey hairs here that'll, heads here that'll remember Cool Wool. And, and as, we got, as we got around the world, Everyone said, whatever happened to that cool wool? Where's that? And I couldn't think of any good reason why, why it wasn't being used. We owned the logo. We owned the name cool wool. It worked. And guess what? The word cool was actually cool again. It had come back. It had gone full circle. Kids use the word cool again. So it was a pretty simple thing for us to do. What was hard is to get those sheep to stand still and get all those Ray-Bans to stay on their head. That was, that was a, a marketing challenge. Okay, so that's, a, that's just a brief summary of the, of, the, of the three websites we've got and the landing page and some of the activity that's happening in the social, social media space there. Some of those figures are modest, some of them are quite, quite impressive. In fact, uh, Cotton Incorporated in, in the United States are keen to work with us and, uh, and develop some um, uh, co-op co uh, research projects, but are also very keen and interested in our social media activity both here and in North America. Uh, the Vogue Woolmark Prize is a, another marketing strategy uh, and it dates back to 1954 where the IWS created a, a prize. It wasn't called the Woolmark Prize then. Uh, the Woolmark was developed in 1964 but uh, there, was a, there was a fashion parade and Karl Lagerfeld and Yves Saint Laurent were the first two winners of this particular program. So again, this program was there in mothballs, not used. And we decided to bring it back, but we wanted to bring it back with a difference. We wanted to bring it back with a partner in the media space, and Vogue came on board uh, to partner with us on that on the, that particular program. And we, and we felt that uh, we didn't want to dish out just a trophy and a cheque to these designers that won, whether that be in the region or as the, as the finalist. Uh, as the international finalist. So we wanted to make sure that if they won, that they had the opportunity to merchandise their products in, in, in a retail business, a high-end retail business. So we went into partnership, tripartite partnerships with Vogue and the various retailers around the world, Bergdorf Goodman, Harvey Nichols, uh, to name a few. So that was the logic of the uh, Woolmark Prize, the International Woolmark Prize. The uh, regional events have been conducted 
uh, and we have six regional winners that go on in February to as part of uh, London Fashion Week and the Woolmark Prize. Uh, the finalist uh, and final will be uh, conducted there. There will be a catwalk show as part of uh, London Fashion Week. <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the judges for that are, are here right now. now. Now, there's one of these that I couldn't even announce at the AGM, but we've now secured Victoria Beckham. Uh, will be one of the judges for that particular program. She Finally, she got her contract back to us. Uh, so that's right. Donatella Versace, you might know Diane von Furstenberg, very famous. Franca Sassani, who is the editor-in-chief of Vogue Italia. She is the Anna Wintour of Europe, if you like. Uh, her sister on the other side of the page there uh, owns a very, very famous uh, brand. And Tim Blanks is the, um, is the editor-at-large for Style.com, which you might, you might know that side. They are very, very prestigious judges. And half of this program has been... Why it's been so successful is not only because of the emerging talent that it's been able to nurture, uh, the, the, the content that we've got into the uh, publications through our partnership with Vogue, but also the judges are attracting a huge amount of attention and um, and 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 these will as well so that's uh, middle of February that will be announced so that's a that's a very very key marketing strategy that we have a lot of our a lot of our marketing strategies are not around necessarily doing an ad in a newspaper or a magazine or tele certainly not television a lot of the above the, the above the line activity in the marketing space we don't do we would prefer to do stunts we would prefer, prefer to do events that draw the attention of of the consumers because and I'll talk about the Prince of Wales in a minute, because the attention that you get for free as a result of these things is remarkable. You know, you put sheep on the roof of the Museum of Contemporary Art with the backdrop of Sydney Harbour, uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge and, and the Opera House with the Prince of Wales and some models and shake, add water and shake. You'll get the attention, trust me. You will get the attention. And, and the same works in any town in Australia. Hamilton, we always do a part of the catwork show there because it gets into the Hamilton Spectre. Now that's at that level, but at the very other extreme with the Woolmark Prize, this is about creating attention, D conducting an event at a modest cost and getting the attention um, uh, from there. So that's the Woolmark Prize. Gold Woolmark was a strategy that we developed especially for China. We knew that China was different. We knew that they had to have something different and we, we did a lot of research there to try and understand what they wanted and they want luxury goods. They're emerging with affluence with, at, at a great pace, at a great pace. And we see this as a totally unique opportunity, a totally unique period of time uh, where we have, the, where we have a, 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 the gift of them emerging with affluence on our doorstep and wanting luxury goods. And wool's a luxury good. It is a, it, it, it is a luxury product. Make no mistake about that. People say, oh, we've got to get it into the masses. No, we don't. No, we don't. Market it to the rich. Sell it to the rich. There is no more wool. It's not what you sell, it's what you sell it at. So certainly this program is very much focused around about, about luxury apparel. And, and, and what we do with this particular Gold Woolmark program is we use it as an umbrella program to go in with the likes of Emina Gildo Zenia and Laura Piana and, 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 um, and many of the other English and, and Italian luxury brands. And we piggyback in and we use that as the, um, as the standard. Heavy, heavy amount of digital content in this particular program. Used to be television. We tried television the first year. It didn't work. We couldn't buy enough. Simply could not buy enough. So we're using a, a digital approach this time. So that's the Gold Walmart program. It's, it's focused. That, that logo was, was gifted to uh, Apollo Zenia. Eminel Gildo Zenia had that logo. That's been around for years, the Gold Walmart logo. He didn't use it, but he didn't want anyone else to use it either. So he, 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 had, he had exclusivity of it. We took it back and we used it. We owned that logo and we took it back and we used it to, as an umbrella project with him uh, and a few others into the, um, into the Chinese market. Okay, I'm just going to play you another video, which is a wrap-up video. We've had the Prince of Wales here recently. Uh, I, I see Annie Ashby here. You'll see she features uh, prominently in this uh, particular video. But this is a wrap-up video of the two events that the Prince of Wales pr uh, gave us when he uh, visited recently. One was in Tasmania at a farm, and then it crosses over to the uh, roof of the Museum of Contemporary Art. I've been asked this morning how the campaign for wool started, and uh, it really started, ladies and gentlemen, because the Prince had a very poor wool check. In 2009, um, he noticed that on the hills of Scotland, Wales, and England, it wasn't worth shearing a sheep. And he 
said to a very good friend of mine, John Pawley, could we discuss how to start a campaign for wool? On Australia Day in 2010, in a very cold barn in Cambridgeshire, we launched a campaign for wool. Grasp the Prince of Wales' message, which is the message of sustainability. The sustainable message is very apt at the moment. The campaign for wool is about trying to connect farm to fashion, to assure the consumer that what they're buying at a very high price comes from a very, very assured provenance, which is a perfect example here today. And it's so amazing that he's sort of doing all this for wool and Australian wool. I think that's the best thing. Really. It's incredibly impressive. I mean, his commitment to the Australian wool industry is extraordinary and great for our fashion industry as well. The message about getting out there and, and supporting the farmers, supporting the fibre, uh, it, it's, you know, what we do in Australia is just extraordinary. So for him to, to be here and put some focus on that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a great to learn that actually uh, he's genuinely actually interested and then also su such a great supporter of actually Australian wool. And uh, it's so refreshing to actually meet someone so genuine and then and at the same time it's really gentle. I think it's been very good for Australians to see what we see overseas quite a lot that they don't, which is the traction that Campaign Paul has got. And I think it's just a, a stamp of permanence with the Princess Association and his willingness to really be an ongoing supporter of what is one of our most effective campaigns. At the media attention from that, the media reach and the, and the volume is, uh, is quite extraordinary as a result of those... Uh, uh, those events. Uh, no, no finer feeling. You know, we talked a little bit about this before, and there's been some criticism about no finer feeling. Is it working? Is it not? Yeah, we think it's working. Otherwise, if, if it wasn't working, we wouldn't be doing it. We were, we were criticised quite strongly as part of our 2009 review of performance, of which uh, the, the, the author of that happens to be here today. We were criticised for not measuring what we do, not, not measuring and, and adjusting the business. And, and I've been very conscious of that, and, and, and we have, we've actually established a measurement and evaluation business unit as part of the company. We've got an economist on staff that's going through the projects one by one, and programs one by one, and writing them up, and doing a benefit cost analysis, and putting it up on the website for everyone to see. If it's not working, it'll be shut down. And this is the same with the, whether it be on the research side of the, uh, the ledger, or on the marketing side. No finer feeling started with two retailers that wanted to partner with us, and there's 30 odd there now. That's a good measurement. The thing that I talked about before, you know, and I'll just dwell on that a little bit, we, we, can, we, we certainly put in there, we want to understand how you benchmarked and how many garments you sold. So if you sold 100 this year, we want you to sell 120 with our help next year. But what's really important here is the out the door price. And you mightn't, you mightn't and I'll just, I'll just talk this through a little bit. If you have a wool sweater that they are selling at $100, the first price point is $100. Now, if it doesn't sell or it's selling moderately, it will be discounted to the second price point, which might be $90 within two weeks. And then if then it goes on from there. It might stay there for two or three weeks and then it'll be discounted to the third price point. And then at the end of the season, they say, right, we had 100 garments to sell. We sold those 100. And the out-the-door price, the average price that went out the door was 92 for example. So the dwell point at the first price point and how, how long it stayed there and the dwell point at the second price point is really interesting and useful for them and us to understand what impact the marketing's had. The, the figures around how many they've sold is just interesting, not so useful. But the out-the-door price, how long it dwelled at that first price point is really interesting. And we want it to stay, we, we want with the assistance of our marketing strategies for them to have a better experience with wool. So next season they come back and they don't, they don't merchandise 100, they merchandise 200. That's where you get the growth. When they have the good experience with wool, they put more in next season. It's not about them selling 110 when they've only got 100 because they can't sell 110 when they've only got 100. The next year, 
is the important year and how it goes on from there. So many of these strategies, many of these partners have a have a